Hello there, welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga, and this is episode number 572. That's 572, which is in Spanish, is what? Cinco, siete, dos. Para mí, conmigo, whatever you say, my name, you know, I don't know, I'm messing it all up. But you know what I mean, I'm getting it little by little, I'm getting it little by little. Hope you're well wherever this podcast may find you. I hope you are well. How am I? Pretty devastated after a humiliating 4-0 away from home loss to our fiercest rivals in Liverpool. But I'm also a little bit content because I somewhat expected that result. So I'm not super angry, but I'm also really pissed off. It's a weird combination of feelings, but you know what it is. You know what it is. If it's your first time checking out this show and you like what you hear at the end of it, why not smash the like? Why not subscribe? Why not leave me a review? Why not share the show with friends and family so it can be reached to, you know, to a wider range of people? Why not do those things if at the end of the show you like what you hear? Why not? And of course, if you want to join the Patreon too as an extra bonus to get bonus episodes of the show, why not you do that too? I haven't updated the Patreon in a while but still it's only a dollar it's only a dollar and updates will come very soon so if you want to jump on there be the first to see the updates then join the patreon at patreon.com for just agostino whilst i appreciate that's not the biggest incentive in the world it's still it's only one dollar it's only equivalent of one pound so help daddy get to the goal that he needs to get to in order for him to afford a new laptop to be able to you know maybe update the camera and all that sort of stuff that will all come mostly based on the patreon if that can happen that can happen if it not it doesn't happen no problem but regardless i'm happy for those of you out there who are just viewing the thing commenting sending me emails sending me dms on instagram i really do appreciate all the support it's been absolutely fantastic over the last what it feels like a couple of years when i've really kind of ramped this thing up i've, do, I've been doing this for a while but it feels like in the last few years it's been getting really really like crazy in terms of support of people kind of you know having nice things to say about the things that i say online and all that malarkey so i'm really appreciative of that and yeah i can't have any um no bad things to say in that regard regarding me and that kind of front so thank you so much for your support much appreciate anyway let's jump on into the show innit? it let's jump right into the show first things first i wanted to talk about and mention today i think if you're just listening to this I've, i'm recording this on what on a tuesday and just now maybe a couple of hours ago the marathon easter weekend they're at Berghain the what's the thing called the is it called the oster club not or something i forgot what it was called right um i have you say easter in german has finally come to an end they started this thing on saturday night maybe you would say even friday but let's say saturday and it's been running from saturday to sunday to monday to tuesday four day raving and by my calculations if you were able to stay from the beginning of Berghain to basically the end where the after party was at a suicide club that might be a total of 66 hours of raving if you take out suicide club i'd imagine it might be maybe six but 56 hours of raving maybe just over 50 from on your feet now again i'm not too sure if there are psychos out there who legitimately have stayed in Berghain for three days if you have you're an absolute psycho and also somebody that i am absolutely jealous of that you have that kind of level of stamina that level of um endurance that level of strength that whatever drive to do that i wish i could do such a thing but it is an interesting challenge to actually have on your bucket list that how long can you stay in a nightclub for until you leave and go home but actually, I'm not even that. I think the moment you step out, you kind of end the challenge. So you can't leave at all. You have to stay in there all the way through. The maximum time I've been in there, I think at one time was probably like 16 hours. I was there at one time. That might have been from like a Saturday or no, that might have been from like a Saturday. No, that might have been from like a Sunday early morning between the hours of like 2 a.m. and 6 all the way until the close that might have been one of those kind of ones you know what i mean if that we can talk about 16 that might, maybe it's 12 let me not say let me not cap and say 16 it might have been 12 the longest time i've been in there for all at one time and i did feel it towards the end i was like oh my god i'm really really tired um so much so i jumped on a taxi to get back to my airbnb which i never really do usually after a club i love to kind of have a walk and kind of get some fresh air move my legs about do you know what i mean 
maybe grab a munch on the way home but that day i was like no nah, i allowed that i'm getting a taxi i don't care how overpriced this is i need to get straight home shower and go to bed but yeah big up everybody that's managed to do that oh my god but also as as you know as i was saying earlier before in the pod as jealous as i am about not being able to go because my plan was to go because i've you know as i've been to berkeley many times you know more than 10 i can probably imagine over my clubbing history but i've never had the uh, ad- privilege or the possibility to go when it was like a big event like a may day or like an easter or like a new year's eve i always just got like on a random date i can get some holiday and i'm free and maybe i got some money and i can go but i wanted to be this i wanted this to be the first time that i go for a, a kind of specific event where i kind of go okay cool they put it on the it's not just a club night it's actually a celebration it's actually a thing that they put together they've put some thought into it. they want a book blah 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 i thought that would have been something that i kind of would be able to do but unfortunately you know by my schedule and the things i have going up i couldn't actually um get out there in time and then when i went to go check lastminute.com to see like you know what maybe i should go i then saw the ticket prices for ryanair in the 300 range i was like no Ryanair is not something I'd ever pay 300 for a ticket for, no matter where it was going. Do you know what I mean? Nothing's worth to sit in coach on Ryanair paying 300 pounds for a ticket. It's not worth it. So I left it to one side. But the thing that brings me some level of, um, some level of happiness is that everyone over there, locals and people that were able to visit, were able to enjoy Berkeley and I feel like to its, to its fullest potential, right? with no mask mandates um there's no need to have a you know antigen test all that sort of nonsense all that's been scrapped now so you can effectively go in as a civilian off the street and party and rave and also because this is the first time they've been open to this i think level at full capacity maybe for two and a half years it makes complete sense that they went so hard in terms of having it open for as long as possible to give people a chance to dance and you know have a fun time and also for them as a business i guess to kind of maybe recoup whatever losses they've had over the last couple of years due to pandemic and due to covid so that's been great to see um but god damn it it's hard not to feel jealous it's hard not to feel jealous but it's also a really big eye-opener in terms of you know sometimes i mentioned on here or i'll talk you know i'll eulogize about berlin and about how they do things and i'll bemoan how we don't do things similar here in london or how we are a step back in certain aspects and blah 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 i have to be honest and say especially the time i've spent here in at home in london enjoying our clubbing scene and engrossing myself into it again as a punter it's been pretty refreshing to just enjoy it that way again and to appreciate it for what it is especially considering most of europe was kind of off bounds to me in terms of going and doing my techno tourism but it also made me appreciate what we have and also recognize that just because what they have over there is great doesn't necessarily mean it can be reflected over here it's just a different world different society everything how they do things and the fact that they have regular events again this was Berghain, other places also opened throughout the entire weekend but this is a regular occurrence during Easter weekend. They have this. And I'm assuming maybe even on May Day, they may even have the same thing happening, right? Um, they have these events that they put on where people can go and party in a nightclub for an extended period of time without getting kicked out, without having the threat of things with getting locked off, with you know great sound systems, with amazing DJs, with people who know how to behave themselves in the club without getting too messed up and starting fights and all this sort of stuff they're just on another level in that way so it makes sense that they have it makes sense that people are well behaved because in you know for lack of a better term they've sort of like well trained they've they've had a good education a good schooling in how to go out and how to rave because it's i would imagine even if you're a real caner right and you're a real lager out and you're a real goon it's impossible really to go too hard out there because everywhere you go is an extended set everywhere you go is extended opening hours there is no such thing as like ben ufo popping in to play a one hour set one and a half hours two hours when you're seeing these big people play they're playing four six eight some of them are playing four as standard in every place they go and some people say four is a short set which i'll bring on to the last point in terms of freddie k so it's no surprise that those guys are so well behaved when they're in the clubs it is a no surprise and it also is no surprise that we're the opposite in that you know you think of a small town outside of london for the most part the pubs close what before 12 sometimes even at 11 p.m 
most of the pubs in order to get money through the till and to get punters through their door they will have these promo deals that they do where they'll have all oh, cocktails for a certain price beer for a certain price whatever they do right i know some pubs in smaller towns outside of london have like different types of beers like a foster might be a bit cheaper than maybe getting um a cronenberg or a carlsberg or something they do those to get people in which obviously leads people to drinking more then you get chucked out of the pub and you want to go to somewhere else to kind of continue your night because you're feeling lit and you want to have a bit of a boogie you go to a local club local clubs let you in but only until 2 a.m where they have to close also but they also want to get you in so they have their own drink promo so you have these horrible um shop they give you that are all different colors and stuff or crazy cocktails that taste like acid but you do it anyway so you can get yourself lit and then by the time you get chucked out of the nightclub you've had an excessive amount of alcohol in two establishments you're then dumped out on the street with all this energy testosterone <laughs> raging through your body and nowhere to go it's no wonder people start fighting people randomly in kebab shops start fighting police start fighting ambulance workers who are there to help people it's an absolute horror show and it's it, that scene gets replicated in many different towns all across the uk everywhere because of our limited you know going out hours so seeing this was a bit sobering but also a kind of an uh, um a weird realization that we're not going to be there because societally we're never going to do this we're, we're super anti-fun as a country we don't really let people kind of enjoy and do their thing and let people live you know what i mean there's always complaints about stuff like even fold's a good example it opened up under the premise of being a 24-hour club it only does 24-hour nights here and there they're not really 24-hour nights they're mostly like extended hour nights because i would imagine the local people complain it's just nonsense like even a place like fold that's in the middle of nowhere it's basically in the middle of a of a what would you call it um an industrial area i remember that area because i used to live in the area where fold is based in cannon town and beforehand the dhl acts or the dhl collection point used to be in that area so you'd have to kind of you know go out of the way to go get a parcel if you missed um collecting it or you missed kind of uh, receiving it at home and it's legitimately in the middle of nowhere you can legitimately throw a rave there and in there and it wouldn't impact the neighbors really that much because you know it's across the train tracks the houses are then you know on the other side of the park it just doesn't make any sense but even that is a place where it has limited the hours so it makes complete sense why we are where we're at and where they are wherever they are but jesus man you can't help but look at the list of names here and how they put it together and think imagine trying to survive 66 hours of non-stop raving from what's happened here at Bergheim all the way to suicide circus um suicide club right where according to freddie k's instagram story he put on an after hours there because he felt like the six hours that he was given to play at Bergheim to close wasn't really a closing set in his head. I'm assuming closing sets for um, Germans or Berliners is what, eight hours plus maybe going forward. So he didn't think that was enough and he decided to put on his own um, little night or maybe he got somebody to call in some favours at a suicide club. But regardless, let's quickly get it up on here so I can show you. But this is um, Freddie K's Instagram story and it says here, um on his page after hours at suicide circus we don't stop free for everyone with a Bergheim bracelet six hours it's not a closing so i don't know if i don't know if closing set means eight or if it means 12 or if it means 10 but regardless they decide to go on and on and another cool thing just to quickly mention before we move on the Bergheim now if you go if you're if you check their program on the day the event's on they now have this cool little widget where apart from the set times being displayed way before the, the party's on which is great because we don't have that stuff in england for the most part um it depends on the promoters putting a party on but clubs usually withhold the set list from the public for nonsense reasons it's stupid i fucking hate it but wherever we move they now have this cool widget on the Berkheim program where depending on who's playing you'll have a countdown timer next to their name so you know exactly how long is left in their set so it's like military precision of course on their end because you never hear anyone starting late or going over their time but also if you'd want to see oh what how long does natty sarah's got her set to play for or how long is stingray on for or how long until am comes on you can see a little timer on the side of their name i saw as i was looking through it i was like oh my god that's a pretty sick feature so big up everyone that was able to go there um hopefully you guys had a good time if you did and you had a blast or you you know there was a dj that kind of stood out for you that you thought was awesome let me know in the comments down below i'd love to hear some of your reviews 
um i've been hearing from looking on the subreddit and general places i was searching maybe on twitter that some people were saying that carl craig was really surprisingly good um i heard some people mention who carl craig heard some people mention um Helena Howe, people said, was really good too. They were fans of that. Supposedly, Boris was really good also. And who else they said was really good? I'm still on the list here. And obviously, Lakuti. But if there's anybody else that stood out to you guys out there, then please let me know in the comments if you went. I'm really eager to hear some of your reviews or your reports from being able to party over there during the entire weekend because I'm so jealous, as you can tell, that I wasn't able to go there myself, man. Super, super, super jealous. Anyway, moving on we got this other topic that popped up on my timeline courtesy of the business techno um instagram account you should definitely check him check them out they were really you know at the forefront in terms of highlighting and exposing some of the more unscrupulous characters within the techno scene or business techno scene who were willing to kind of put everyone's health at risk at the peak of the pandemic and go and do these play graves obviously the perception around play graves has changed somewhat over the over the you know months and years that preceded it but overall it was good to get insight into kind of seeing you know the shittiness levels of some of these big djs so that you weren't really kind of pinning your hat on the fact of them being good human beings and you're just maybe following them as a dj right you're a fan of what they do in terms of their artistry but you're not fooling or kidding yourselves that these are actually nice people that you'd want to hang out with you know what i mean outside of them playing a set like that's it it should just end i've always said i've always said i've come to the conclusion even myself because i used to sometimes be that person who'd kind of fan out at these type of people it's especially once you start djing yourself and once you start maybe promoting your own events it, it really demystifies djing because i've always said it's the it's the kind of lowest bar of entry to make it in the music industry because it's not really an instrument it's really easy to learn and with the modern technology out there you don't really need to be technically proficient to get anywhere in djing you just need to be i would say hard working persistent maybe have some sort of um gimmick or stick that you can use to your advantage work your ass off of course network all that stuff and you can get there but in terms of the ability to play other people's music in loud spaces and whatnot the barrier for entry is super super low and maybe because of that it kind of creates some monsters some level of entitlement because everybody in there deep down knows that the job anyone could do it's similar to like fashion industry the fashion industry i've always said is full of cunts because for the most part outside of the actual designers who make the clothing that goes on a runway and some of the people who work behind the scenes to make or to produce and manufacture the clothing everyone else is replaceable you could find somebody on instagram or on twitter who could do a styling job for most of these big brands out there if they were given the, the time to learn and to basically you know have the right people around them you could give the right person on twitter and instagram the possibility to write for vogue magazine all these kind of places and they would do a pretty decent job if they were given the access to go to these shows and access to talk to these designers and all that malarkey like it's not that hard to do so maybe most of the people that you'd meet in fashion who are cunts like the you know like i said like the writers like some of the stylist people like you know you know all the all the kind of middlemen type people are cunts because they know deep down that oh anyone could take my job and maybe that's why some djs come across like that too maybe that's the reason or they're overinflated you know um fees they get paid the fact that everyone kind of especially in the uk stands there and looks at them and you know puts them on the pedestal in terms of actually in, instead of actually dancing and enjoying the music they're playing they kind of stare at them and are more fans of the person as opposed to boy the, the ability to play good music all that stuff might be a part of it but there's an interesting story that kind of happened over the weekend that might illustrate more of what I said and also might throw up some interesting questions in terms of how this person conducts themselves. So this was a post that Business Techno obviously highlighted to me and it was regarding this DJ called Bambi who had been called in last minute to support the Blessed Madonna, formerly known as the Black Madonna. And as I posted on the title of this image GR thing that I did, right? Image image you are, sorry, um what you call it, uh gallery thing that I did of the screenshot of her Instagram story. Is the Blessed Madonna racist or a cunt? 
there are two distinct things here because I've got the feeling this story just proves that she's probably more of a cunt and a shitty person as opposed to a racist but maybe you guys have a different interpretation on this so let's read through the story so this is a screenshot taken from Bambi's Instagram account her Instagram account is BAM underscore BII so it says as follows while I usually opt out of sharing explicitly online last night was such a literal microcosm of the larger issues faced by black women in electronic music I feel I have to be transparent three days ago I was offered a booking for a DJ producer friend uh, so for a DJ such producer Fred Again's team to play alongside him and notable white techno house DJ bless Madonna and like I just said notable white techno <laughs> DJ bless Madonna I would say she's more house than techno, but anyway, that's my order it goes in. Formerly known as the Black Madonna. By the way, until the petition was circulated for her to change her name, which was, again, a bit of a faux pas in that regard, but I can understand why she's hesitant to change her name, but in terms of what was going on in society at that time, waiting for a petition to change it was a bit mad. But anyway, we move. I accepted the gig and the promotional material with my name on it shared um, on it. Uh, sorry, and, and promotional material with my name on it was shared publicly. The day of, I was notified by the organizers that my set was at 2 a.m. and that the event would shut promptly. So it would shut completely at 3 a.m. After driv driving, driv why can't I read aloud? What's wrong with me? After driving out nearly an hour to the venue, I arrived, approached the DJ booth to check in. Immediately, I was stopped by Fred's manager, who told me I would instead be playing at 2.30 or even at 3 a.m., even though she was told the event was going to close at 3 a.m. Um, even though I was, even though he informed another DJ the venue would death shut at 3 a.m. So she's getting mucked about a bit here. When I went to check in with the venue, they confirmed that 3 a.m. shut-in time. When I approached the booth again, I tried to directly ask both Fred and Bless Madonna my set time and they literally ignored me and then began to rudely address me saying different times with clearly no intention of letting me play to what was now a very big crowd. Because again, it's the end time, peak time. And I'm assuming she's also saying in this kind of without saying that she also brought a bit of a crowd down there too. So they're coming to see me. There's people there obviously enjoying your set, but let me play. I left frustrated and then returned a third time. After ignoring my several attempts to speak, Fred suggested I just not play at all, despite me being booked by his team. Next screenshot. It's, it's a simple concept that is unethical to book me, use my name on promotional materials and then deliberately deny me the same opportunity as everyone else. But as a, the only black woman on the bill being blocked from performing by two white privileged artists becomes so racist. I think that's a bit of a stretch, but I get where she's coming from. It wasn't until the support of several of my friends I spoke to, um, several staff and broke down how obviously problematic and racist the situation was that I was permitted to play for 45 minutes. So it was only until that she decided to scream racism that finally they acquiesced and said, you know what, maybe you've got a point. <laughs> this is bad. Literally, this is shit. Literally, this shit is ABCs. It's crazy to be in an era where we all know the black origins of dance music, but white people still resort to racist gatekeeping tactics to disregard black women in this realm it feels important for me to share this because on the principle of the fact that i know so many women in general and particularly black women are experiencing similar treatment or worse in music poor conduct is normalized via whiteness patriarchy or fame hmm. i'm really in in invested in shutting that down i'm not letting anyone make me feel like an outsider in the sound or a culture that's inherently mine to express the problem with that though the end bit is that there are so many people out there willing to take that level of abuse and disrespect with a smile that it's pretty much impossible to change pretty much because it's ingrained in it do you know what i mean from the way that agents act books bookers act venue managers act you know door guys sometimes act there is that sense of super say superiority but gatekeeping whatever it is you know we decide your dreams we decide if you make it or not that is pretty much impossible for somebody to come in on their own even with a small collective to change things because as soon as somebody gets opportunity to play somewhere they'll suddenly forget all of these experiences they've had 
because this sounds to me like something that I went through coming up, DJ myself, where you just get mucked about because you're no one. In the eyes of the person that booked you, you're not somebody well known. You're maybe not as big as DJs, you have people on the bill. You maybe aren't that well known to them personally. All these things can affect the way that they treat you. And the way that you maybe respond to it can also maybe affect your future possibilities to get more bookings. So you have to put up with a lot more bullshit in order to get more bookings, but then your pride and your ego will suffer along the way because you'll be treated like absolute shit. So it's a, it's, a, it's a mad one to kind of get through your head. It continues here. Is any more? Yeah, one more screenshot. Hey, all, I, I just want to say I appreciate everyone's kind messages and insight. It's important that we treat this dynamic like it's everybody's problem. Getting the most horrible messages about being playing the race card and now being called names, LOL. Let's be, but let me be clear. I've told you at three times uh, over Asia once. I am familiar with being the only black person on the bill, dealing with promoters and DJs and audiences that have rarely come into contact with black people. I'm not overly, I'm not overly sensitive nor have i ever called anyone out by their name online before which i get and understand but in general to go back to the title of this of this post and what i wanted to talk about is Blessed madonna racist or a cunt i think this is more cunty than it is racist i think there's a lot of kind of layers to this going through like i said before as i've become a dj myself i've dealt with issues when you're coming up and you're trying to make your name where people just don't treat you with any respect. Sometimes you get denied entry at the door because they don't believe you're the DJ. Your name's not on the list. And even if it's on the list, they kind of give you hassle to get in. That could be, again, based on who I am, based on my color, based on my age, whatever it may be. But most of it, I would say, has to do with the fact that I'm just not known. As soon as you're known, because I've, I've, I've seen what happens when somebody that is known says that you're cool and how everyone changes. And I know that it's not a race thing because it was a race thing it wouldn't matter what someone says you're still going to spit in my face but the fact that people change and legitimately show you their asshole and tell you to go raw dog shows me that it's mostly just an image thing a clout thing which is annoying but it kind of is what it is and you have to play it to your advantage in some way so I've got denied at the door in when I was booked online, booked to go there. I've had things where you go to arrive to go play, you do your set, and at the end of the gig, the DJ then suddenly, sorry, the promoter suddenly disappears and refuses to, or or kind of ref, just simply outright refuses to pay you. Um, you know, DJs that you're meant to be playing after, because they're bigger, they decide to go over the time and you don't get to play for long. Crazy shit like that happens on a continual basis. And just in general, the idea that you, because I, I felt that, especially at the time when I was coming up, there was a period in time where I was always the one being called to do last minute fill-ins. And after a moment, especially when you do a cup on you smash it and you do a good job and everyone says, oh, you do really well, we're impressed, we're going to keep you in contact with you, da, da, da. but they keep asking you to do last minute things. It can sometimes get a little bit annoying. Like, why don't you give me an actual slot ahead of time so I can actually prove myself on the main stage instead of always coming in as a last minute cover for somebody when they get too smashed or they can't or they miss their flight or something. Book me as an actual person. But, you know, it's something you have to go through and something you have to decide how much you're willing to put up with in order to kind of get to your dream. Everyone's got a different, everyone's got a different threshold that they're willing to kind of abide by, unfortunately, which means it's hard to get people to kind of band around and make some collective change going through. Then on top of this, with this kind of particular issue, I looked at the girl's Instagram, who's the DJ who's, who's, who's complaining about this, and she's a very attractive black girl. Again, this is me saying this, my point of view, don't kill me for it. Very attractive black girl, also very slim, also very stylish, and also has a, from what you can tell online, again, don't know much about her, has a very outgoing personality. I would, I would imagine part of the reason why this went this way at the time that she went there was because Bless Madonna maybe just felt really inadequate, inferior, um, maybe felt some way that that lady came up and tried to DJ and wanted to DJ at the same booth. Do you know what I mean? There was some level of like hate in there because of, you know, how much of a larger woman that she is and that whole self-consciousness that comes up in it because whenever you look at Bless Madonna's flipping Instagram or you look at comments in the YouTube or her live stream, the thing people always talk about is her mixing style and maybe her weight. It's a kind of common thing that goes up or she's ugly or whatever it may be. So I'm sure those cons those comments will get to you after a while and it's something that you're obviously gonna have to deal with, battle with, especially it being an image thing DJ nowadays, right? It's less about the music, less about what how you play and less about the digging and all that stuff. It's mostly about an image Image. Well, I don't say mostly, but image does play a big role in it. So it wouldn't surprise me if part of the reason why she was such a cunt to this girl was because of what that girl looked like. 
because something tells me if that girl was also fat and also kind of maybe represented what blessed madonna represents in terms of her look and how her appeal and how she conducts herself i don't think she'd have the same issue that's the problem and again that speaks to a larger problem overall right it just speaks to a larger problem overall but i think you would find more instances of this exact scenario being shared by other people who come up in a scene regardless of what color decree they are especially if they even if they happen to be the you know i'm sure there are other white djs who will say i've had the exact same experience with another white dj that would lead me to believe that it's less of a racist thing and more so just a cunty dj dance music industry scene thing that happens again and again and again because you don't have the necessary clout fame you know whatever name to afford you um to afford you the decency of having people treat you with manners that's how sh it's really shambolic but I, honestly i swear to god i've been there myself even most recently i've been at a very popular nightclub i've been there as a punter asking people certain questions and maybe they're giving you, you know, the cold shoulder and then you bump into somebody that's well known that knows you as a person and likes you it's like hey i guess do you know what's up and you see the eyes and the posture of the person that gave you the cold shoulder and tried to big time you completely change because of that person who kind of you know gave you that social proof and co-signed you as a person in real time i've seen it so i know these people are just cunts flat out because they don't want you to get in so the gatekeeping thing i agree with in her in that regard for sure there's a gatekeeping thing because they don't want you to get in because they know if you get in you do a good job you could eventually take their spots because that's the way the thing works whoever's the one that gets the best crowd reaction they can guarantee you're going to sell tickets the promoters in the venue because aren't really loyal in that regard they just kind of go by the ticket numbers the beer sales the number of people that are there it's pretty black and white in that regard so if you get in you're going to obviously take food off their table you're going to take away a, a gig that they've had cushy for the last i don't know six or seven years so they have a lot to lose by getting you in but the the flip side of it i feel like is that the scene is more vibrant and more alive and also the chances and opportunities to play are more abundant than they've ever been and sharing is actually the way that this scene survives like actually opening your arms and opening the doors allowing people access to get things that you had access that you found difficult to get hold of is the way that this scene will continue to evolve because fresh new faces will keep coming in that's probably the reason why people were latched onto the likes of peggy Gu and all those guys and all those girls sorry when they came through like Emily lens and all these people right you think of the SPF DJs, the VTSs and stuff. All these people came through at the same time. Even what's her name? I forgot the other one I was mentioning. But all those females that came through at the same time. Maybe people latched onto them so quickly and they became so famous so fast because punters were just desperate for something new. They just kept saying the same old tired faces again and again and again. And after a while, it gets boring. So just seeing somebody fresh that looks completely different, it just didn't reinvigorates you. But it took somebody to step aside or maybe to open the, or to leave the door ajar as they were walking through to allow those people to have a chance to get in as well. Uh, but I don't know how that changes because it feels like, you know, from the way they act, DJing or being involved in the dance music scene must be one of the best jobs in the world because they don't want to let it go. They don't want to let people have chances they don't want to bring you in you know they book you for a gig they let you they let you arrive there and you have to play a 45 minute set by the time you're setting up and plugging in your flipping usbs and your headphones and the person's playing their last tune that's already 40 minutes like it's an absolute piss take in that regard it happens so often though i've i've had it happen to me where you you meant to be playing an hour and now you're playing 30 minutes you meant to be playing two now you're playing one hour and a half because the persons went over time you don't get in because they don't have your name on listen because the party's going on you can't call the promoter to come get you in loads of really dumb embarrassing things that don't make any sense that should be dealt with before you get there in a professional manner don't get dealt with and then you end up having to you know fucking fiddle with your balls outside as you're waiting to kind of get in with all your bags packed and stuff it's absolute piss take but i would say it's more of a, a reason or more of an example of the blessed madonna being a cunt than it is her being racist but maybe i'm not looking at it the right way so if you guys have read that story and you think differently i'd love to hear your thoughts and opinions on it leave me a comment down below and let me know moving on from that um of course we need to talk about man united's embarrassing embarrassing 4-0 defeat at the hands of Liverpool away from home in the Premier League. Now, all in all, 
the result wasn't a, a the result wasn't a surprise but the thing with football that's interesting despite how much time especially as a fan you try to sort of condition yourself to the impending doom that's about to arrive in terms of a bad performance or a bad result because you're emotionally invested in the club and you support it and you want to see them do well seeing them not do well in real time always hurt it's always going to pull at the, the, the heartstrings and it's always going to fill you with sadness especially if you're a fan like myself who was never deluded and always knew that this idea that the managers were always solely to blame for Man United's demise was always a lie and it had more to do with the fact that we are owned by maybe some of the worst football owners in the history of the game in the Glazers and they have installed some of the most inept people at the boardroom level to make the football decisions that we've ever seen in the history of the game also so much so that we are probably one of the worst run clubs in the world given our stature given our history given our resources our money we generate we are 100 percent one of the worst run clubs in the world hands down and unfortunately for us the other clubs in and around in and amongst us in the premier league the other clubs in europe the other clubs around the world even have all caught up off the field in terms of their structure in terms of their commercial side their scouting um, their player recruitment their youth teams all this stuff that you would say the bigger teams had big advantages in they have now basically caught up and even if you look at the premier league the money is you know bigger than the money is kind of larger than it's ever been in the premier league so if you're a small club you can maybe afford to hold on to some of your talented young players and basically give them the carrot that they'd be able to play first team football at the ages you know between the ages of like 17 and 21 more so than going to a top team which then limits these top teams from poaching all of the young talent from up and coming clubs or from clubs in the championship or clubs you know outside of the top six or whatever it may be so that's basically led to the situation we're in now so we basically got away with it for a long time under the glazers because number one we had a flipping legendary once in a lifetime manager in Alex ferguson but we also got away with it because at the time the competition in amongst us outside of the top four wasn't that great, especially in the Premier League and also out in Europe. But now that the other clubs have caught up and we are still doing the same things that we did when we had Sir Ferguson and just hoping that we somehow stumble across a genius manager, we are at where we are. And now at the moment where, you know, basically away from, I think when you combine the home defeats and away from home, we've now lost 9-0 to our fiercest rivals at Liverpool. Now, don't get me wrong. Liverpool are challenging for the Premier League title. They're challenging for the Champions League, domestic cups. Like, they're on another planet. But you still wouldn't think, when it comes to Derby Day, there'd be such a kind of chasm, chasm, wherever you say that word, in difference in quality. The golf in quality is just another on another level. That game was really sobering to watch as a fan. Incredibly sobering to watch it in real time and see just how far away we are from them not even as a club just as as players as men as expectations like those guys gave up on a pitch pretty sharp as soon as that first goal went in a four minute mark a lot of us fans myself included were like oh no this might be another five we might get hit for 10 because you could see the players on the pitch especially my name players were already scared they were worried they didn't think that we could have a way to get back into this game and you know of course that kind of played out to be the way it did and if you look at some of the stats of the game itself it's pretty alarming in terms of kind of telling you the story of of who is the better team on the day united had um two shots to liverpool's 14 one shot on target to liverpool's five we had 28 percent of the ball possession they had 72 we had 349 passes they had 879 we had 73 percent pass accuracy they had 90 90 <laughs> And I'm actually surprised the yellow cards aren't as more or the fouls aren't as aren't triple the amount because you'd imagine if you're getting beat or humiliated in the way that we were against your fiercest rivals, one of the first things you kind of draw for as a sportsman is just to 
will gee yourself up with attitude and aggression and just go in for a flying tackle just to kind of set the move and restart things and wake your teammates up didn't happen until the very end until Hannibal came on one of our youth team players came on started rattling players and actually looked like he had a bit of pride he had a bit of embarrassment he had a bit of shame the fact that our local rivals were pinging the ball around us and making us look like mugs but that didn't last for long because for after that things kind of just petered out and we ended up losing 4-0 we we're lucky not to kind of hit get hit with five to be completely honest um Ralph Ragnick has some really interesting words to say about the entire performance that I thought was um refreshing and I think overall even though Ralph Ragnick's um interim spell at United hasn't been the most revolutionary that we would have hoped it hasn't had the impact we all hoped it would do in terms of him coming in under this big um, reputation of being the master of gag and press and building up clubs and being somebody that works as a football director and helps to you know um get the clubs where they need to be and get them on the equal footing blah 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 blah, blah making competitive it didn't happen he probably didn't have enough time enough resources regardless of what it is he didn't have the impact that he needed to have but i think as a human i think as a as a professional um, as a coach as a football person with his frankness and his honesty and the fact that he is an external person who has no ties to united before this time at united that he's been there for the interim boss and in the two years he's going to be as a consultant it's been refreshing to hear him speak so frankly and upfront about the issues that we have and i hope that or i know that because united are very attuned to public perception they don't like they don't like being embarrassed they don't like being humiliated they know they don't run well but they just don't want to change anyway they're gonna probably change how we are run and put some place put some changes in place just because of how honest and upfront ralph has been and how he exposed them they're gonna want to correct it so that's been the benefit of having him as a manager even though it hasn't been successful on the pitch i think off the pitch the benefits are going to be felt for a long long time going forward because i think if we didn't have this with ralph i don't see it changing because results don't really seem to impact the way the board moves in general trophies droughts and stuff don't just dis don't decide that either quality of football doesn't decide that either so sometimes getting beaten humiliated week in week out against your fiercest rivals dropping lower and lower on the table so you don't get you know um certain positions you know basically equate to certain prize money being dished out you don't obviously finish in the european places that obviously limits the amount of money you're going to make all these things affect the bottom line of the glazers which is the main thing they kind of live by so if that happens maybe some change will happen but anyway this is a ralph ragnick talking after the game regarding his comments with how terrible united were against liverpool ralph the the first half nothing really went right for you obviously an early injury an early goal as well um, you changed the formation. Do you regret the formation that you started with? Do you perhaps wish you'd played a, a four rather than a three or a five? I don't think that this would have changed <laughs> anything, to be honest. Uh, um, the first goal that we conceded uh, was not part of the game plan to be that high up and, and, uh, and concede a, a counter-attack like we did after, the fifth, after five minutes. Um, and that changed, obviously, the, 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 the game. Um, and uh, yeah, in the first half, we were just not good enough. We didn't win any first ball, not to speak second balls. We were just second best in all relevant areas. And um, second half, yes, we decided to replace one of our center backs by, by Jaden Sancho. Uh, the first 25 minutes, we were better in the game. We had uh, pressure on the ball, at least at times. Had two or three moments ourselves, but the third goal then killed the game off. I felt that goal, the third goal for Liverpool, almost came as a relief. They were, they didn't start the second half very well. You looked much brighter, and it looked like you know a United goal at that stage might change things. But obviously, at three nil, it's almost impossible here. Yes, I agree. That's why I said the third goal just finished the game off. Uh, again, a ball that we shouldn't have played. Uh, pressing invitation. If you play a 12-yard ball into Anthony Alanga, who is a player for the ball behind the, their back line. Um, this is uh, inviting them for exactly those kind of moments. And six seconds later, we, we, the ball was in our, it was in our net. Um, it, there were that little period of positives, but this is a very difficult result for Manchester United fans to take. On the back of the game at Old Trafford before you arrived, you know, this, this is two games in which Liverpool have really crushed Manchester United, and that's very hard for United fans. I know. Uh, it's embarrassing, it's, it's, it's disappointing, it's 
maybe even humiliating, but yeah, we just have to accept that uh, they are six years ahead of us now. I mean, when Jurgen Klopp came uh, and what they changed at this club, they lifted the whole club, the whole, not only the team, the whole club, the city to a completely different level. And this is what has to happen here in the next transfer windows. The crazy thing is, he said, Liverpool are six years ahead of us. Six years. If he's saying that, with his kind of external point of view, not knowing how terrible of owners the Glazers are, and the fact that they've sold every manager that's been at United Dreams in terms of signings, in terms of, you know, revamping the squad, getting players out, getting players in. If he's saying six years, then it's safe to say it's going to be another 10 years until United are a title-winning, Champions League competing club again. I don't mean winning those things. I mean, look, let me change that. It. It's going to be 10 years until United are another Premier League challenging, Champions League challenging club. I don't even mean winning them. Just challenging and being in and amongst it. The same way Chelsea were in the beginning of the season and they kind of tailed off. That kind of way. Maybe you're like 6, 8, 10 points within range. It's going to be another 10 years until that happens on a consistent basis. 10 years. And you know what's really concerning? There's no guarantee the teams in and amongst us are going to stay stagnant. There's already talk already at the moment that supposedly Erling Haaland has decided his next club is going to be Man City. If that's the case and City decide, oh sorry, and Pep decides to stay at City for another three seasons, what can they do? given the resources, given the actual football people they have in charge. That's another challenge for Klopp to kind of respond to. He's going to respond. The new owners of Chelsea are going to come in. They're going to respond. We are in for a dark period in time in the United history as United fan. Dark, dark period. It's really, truly concerning. It really, really is. But, you know, what can you do? But then we move on. And I wanted to lastly end the little football segment here talking about the one legend that is Harry fucking Maguire has to be spoken about. So before the game, Harry Maguire decided or his PR team or his agent or whoever decided really, I think it's a bad decision because I think if you're going to do a press run, a little interview thing to kind of give yourself some good press before a big game or before any game, the game to do it at would have been, um, at home to Norwich because weirdly enough he did play pretty well against Norwich now again it's Norwich they're going to get relegated they're probably one of the worst teams in the league anyway in terms of their quality overall but he did play well against them it was probably one of his best games he's played this season he was very commanding very imperious but as per usual or as often that is the case with Maguire no one questions his ability to play against crappy teams anyone could basically do that but at the highest level he always comes wanting and so far, especially in games that have mattered, when we've conceded goals, maybe he's not always directly involved in us conceding them, but he is somewhere within the mix doing, making some sort of mistake that leads to a sequence of things that eventually results in a goal. All the time it happens. And I think the game against Liverpool is a good example. You couldn't pin all the goals on him, but there were individual things that he did that you just maybe thought to yourself like what is a top no 80 million pound defender who's meant to be the captain of the club should be doing such a thing why isn't he commanding his line why is he stepping up on his own why is he always so flat-footed why can't he turn why doesn't he anticipate this da, 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 da. all these things come into mind but then i was always but the other thing that's always i thought really disappointing with Maguire. forget his ability to play football because i don't think something he chooses to do he doesn't choose to play horrible it is what it is we you are given with the gifts we're given we made the best out of it and it's not his fault he didn't force the club to pay 80 million for him he didn't force the club to sign him outright the club thought he was going to be the best player for the position and he's going to be somebody that we can maybe pin our defense on and build our you know spine of our team on and now it hasn't been the case but it's not his fault but the one thing i feel like he really lets himself down is his attitude he has a real lack of self-awareness, a real lack of personal responsibility and a real lack of reading the room. 
and I thought at first it was just his family that were doing it they were kind of gassing him up because on social media I think like his family don't do many favors I think he's got sisters and mums and brothers and stuff and they get online after he's had bad games and they'll start arguing with fans going back and forth no usually when he has good games they'll start arguing with fans they'll start putting up memes sharing stats all these sorts of things and obviously they don't help because he has more bad games than he does have good for United especially in recent years or in recent times sorry so but now we know through his interviews that it's not his family guessing him he actually guesses himself like he legitimately thinks he's a top top class defender and he can't understand where he gets criticism he gets and this is part of the interview that he gave to sky sports ahead of the game against liverpool that we of course lost where he basically says the following yeah of course i'm in, uh, i'd say from this season i've had some bad games um but I wouldn't be playing every game for Manchester United in the starting eleven if I'd been playing bad every game or not, not playing well enough. There's a reason why both managers have put me in the starting eleven every game um, for what I bring to the team, what I bring to, to the starting eleven. Um, but I do also understand that I'm the captain of this club. Um, I cost a lot of money. Um, and when things aren't going well and we're conceding too many goals, I'm going to get criticised. Yeah, of course. I'm in, uh, I'd say from this season, I've had some bad games. What an insane thing to say. Some bad games. You've had a lot of bad games. Also, you would imagine an interview like this. The first thing to say is like, I take a lot of responsibility for the way that we concede goals because I'm the leader. I'm the meant to be at the back. I'm meant to be commanding the back line. And there's been a lot of games where I feel like we probably haven't been the, our best you know, in terms of organisation, defensive safety and all this stuff, but we're constantly working on it on a training field to get it right so that we can give our midfielders and our attackers the best possible chance to win games because in big games or in games in general, the less goals you concede, the more chance you have of winning games. So I take responsibility of that. It's something I'm actively trying to improve on. Not, I don't have many bad games and the reason, and I wouldn't be playing every week for Man United if I wasn't good. No, the reason why you play for Man United or any club any big player club that especially any player that gets signed for a fee that he gets signed for there's somewhat an obligation for the club to play you even if sometimes you're not playing well outside of maybe man city where pep can do what he wants he can kind of have Grealish on the bench and bring him on to kind of waste minutes but most big clubs if you sign a player for that amount of money you're kind of obliged to play him because you spent that amount of money on him you kind of have to get the best out of your resource and hope that he can kind of turn it on or kind of play himself into form then off the back of that when it comes to United we don't have many good centre-backs anyway for whatever reason Harry Maguire has been blessed with the gods he hardly gets injured if ever he misses two games in a row so he's always fit he's an 80 million pound um, centre-back he also plays for England there's no chance he's not ever gonna pl not play because he's legitimately maybe the first name of the team sheet that's always available to play but that's not an indication that you're playing well, you absolute dullard. It doesn't make any sense. And also, no person is going out there and saying, oh, as a review of his performances, I don't think anyone with sense or with a brain is saying that just because he gets picked by managers, that automatically means he's good. The whole point of people talking about football and speaking about it like my, I am, having not played professionally, is that from what we can see as fans looking at it from the outside in, you are not playing well. Sometimes managers can have different opinions to fans. Sometimes they can. But the large consensus among the fans base is that he is one of our main issues in that team. Whether or not Eric Ten Hag can coach it out of him, it means to be said. But there's clearly an issue there with his performance levels. Otherwise, no one will be talking about it. But in whatever land he lives in, that doesn't happen. There's not such thing as him not playing well. And I think that it basically is representative of the entire team and the club right because i can't really be too mean and harsh on maguire because i feel like this sort of attitude is only being tolerated because of the environment that he plays under which is the glazer ownership there is no accountability with the players because in all you know for the all the managers that have come after alex ferguson were all fired based on the results on the pitch but no one from the club really player wise 
was kind of punished for a lack of us fitting into the top four, a lack of us winning trophies. Players don't get punished for it, only the managers. So it's no surprise that the players feel like they have authority or they can, they're entitled or they can, you know, recommend managers and pick and choose when they play or when they press because the club allows them to run them up. And the previous manager, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, basically said Harry Maguire could do no wrong. So it's no surprise that he legitimately thinks he can do no wrong. He was also given the captain's armband under that same manager. So it's no surprise that he also thinks he's such a big time Charlie. But the lack of reading the room and self-awareness is absolutely frightening. But again, it's no surprise. But I'm curious to see how long he stays at the club, personally, for me. In an ideal world, the way Harry Ten Hag plays football, with what we've seen of him in Ajax... There isn't any chance that Maguire is going to be the centre back for him, especially not as a captain. Maybe as somebody to come off the bench, maybe as somebody to play in a specific system. Maybe if you say if you want to play like a back three, like how he plays for England, he could maybe do a job. But in terms of being your number one centre back, a play that you would build your spine of your team off of, it's, I don't see how Maguire is going to be that guy for us long term. But he is English. He did come under a high transfer fee. So the likelihood of us selling him at any profit is just impossible and who would want to take him anyway even for an inflated reduced fee or even for a reduced fee sorry it just doesn't make any sense it really is a baffling state of affairs but again we are where we are because of a lack of direction with our owners and everything that they do um but yeah Harry Maguire might be one of the worst United captains I've ever seen in recent years everything about him is like everything about him is unlikable the way he plays football, to the way he carries himself, to how his family interacts with fans online, everything, the way he, protect, he gets protected by some members of the press, it's just disgusting to see. The guy is horrible, 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 and nowhere near worth the 80 million we paid for him, nowhere even close. And again, it's not his fault, I get it, but God damn it, your shit. Anyway, let's move on, let's move on. Um, what else we want to talk about here? Let's move that. Let's change this. Let's move this again and go here. Oh yeah, I thought this was pretty interesting. So this is courtesy of page six. Are you guys aware that um Black China, the what would you call her? The video vixen? I don't know how you describe Black China. But Black China is suing the Kardashians as an entire family. Because she feels like um, they played a part in getting her reality TV show that she had with Rob Kardashian cancelled. I had no idea this was happening. I only found out now because Page Six put out this report about the first day in court, which is as follows as the headline. Kardashians visibly annoyed by sex tape comments during jury selections. And it's hilarious to read because essentially what's happened is that for the first time in a long time, I would imagine, they've had to encounter the Kardashians, I'd mean, real people like normal normies on the street who have their own interpretation or idea of who they are as people because i feel like sometimes the criticism they get as a family mostly comes through the prism of like media elites entertainment people cultural commentators and whatnot so you can sometimes be divorced from what the general public thinks of them as people and you would imagine if you're a, um, a parent um just a regular person it can be difficult to like them as a family because you would feel like especially if you have a daughter that they are the reason why you're having so many issues you know raising your daughter in a certain way maybe enforcing certain rules um maybe helping them get over certain body issues and dysmorphia and self-worth and all these kind of things and it'll be natural and okay to kind of see the kardashians and all the nonsense that they perp perpetuate over the years i feel like oh these guys might be at fault for what's going on with me at home or for society overall in terms of what you're observing out there in culture. And um, for whatever reason, also, it feels like they don't seem to get that as a family, which which makes sense. I mean, they live in a gated community. They fly private. They're always driving in luxurious cars. When you have wealth, it kind of isolates you and they're ridiculously famous. So they don't really interact with regular people. But regular schmegular people will always look at you side eye especially you think of the whole Khloe Kardashian debacle with her you know um, baby daddy Tristan 
that whole thing was really weird to wrap yourself your head around even somebody who doesn't even watch the show just to view it from the outside you're like hold on you guys ostracized and kicked out um what's her name jordan woods for the alleged incident that supposedly she tried to hook up with justin tristan or whatever it may be but then on the same token he then continues to cheat on this lady in very public way to the point where he gets another one night stand woman pregnant and then she has his baby but then you're forgiving that and you're able to bring him back in a home and make it work but then you were went full scorched earth on this lady who might have had a little cheeky lap lap sit or whatever that was inappropriate at the time it just didn't make any sense like why do you go so hard at the girl when clearly the issue is the guy that lives in your house but again we move but I thought these comments are really interesting because it goes to show how disconnected I feel like most celebrities are from what regular people think of them, um, which is obviously beneficial. It's probably not the most beneficial thing to tap into what everyone thinks, especially if they're not your fans. But I thought this report of how they conducted themselves when certain things came up was really interesting anyway. So the article on page six says as follows, the Kardashians and Jenners were less than thrilled to hear Kim Kardashian's sex tape scandal during jury selection for the family's pending trial against Black China. Page Six was inside Los Angeles Supreme Court on Monday when Kardashian Jenner attorney Michael Rhodes asked a group of potential jurors if they had strong positive or negative feelings toward the reality TV television people, right? Yes. One potential juror, a man who appeared to be in his 50s or 60s, claimed He'd never watched Keeping Up Kardashians, but noted, I have watched Kim Kardashian's sex tape, and I don't think I can be impartial on this case. <laughs> imagine, right? That was a big part of her, their success as a family overall, you would imagine, especially in terms of popping them into the cultural zeitgeist. And despite everything that's gone on, the billions that this lady's men made, all this sort of stuff, and family and career stuff, blah, 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 blah. It's still a weird smudge and a mark on their name even though you feel like nowadays nudity porn sex work only fans all the adult content has now become way more acceptable you feel like in society but still for whatever reason this sex tape thing doesn't leave kim as a cloud it doesn't go away and it, it kind of covers the entire family really because essentially like i said they all benefited from that sex tape leaking and then basically being able and their names being propelled into the limelight and obviously they took advantage of it and maybe it was always meant to happen anyway but regardless it's very interesting nowadays that still it's kind of a taboo i guess for the lady for kim and herself involved it makes sense because it's a private moment that you maybe didn't want to get out there it depends who you believe some people feel like it was something planned i don't know but it's it maybe as well, even if you did plan to do it in your 20s, you're now in your 40s and you're a mum of four, you might just be simply embarrassed by it and you wish it would, would go away. Crazy. And it also goes to show that what Wike 100 was saying, that that laptop existed with more footage is true because clearly it still affects them, um, you know, in a way that probably shouldn't have if that other footage didn't exist, if that makes sense. The response elicited a roar of laughter from the other potential jurors sitting in the audience. After that remark, Cleo Kardashian Face 7 was seen fixing Kim's hair, dark locks, as if to comfort her sister. Kris Jenner then shook her head and the same man reiterated to the juror that it would be difficult for him to serve as a juror because he would be replaying that sex tape in his head again and again. How many times have you watched that sex tape, brother? I only think you need to watch it once. It's not even a sex tape. It's like a weird video recording of them being intimate and it's just a bit awkward it's not the most entertaining tape though, especially if you watch actual porn like why not watch actual adult entertainment with actual professionals instead of watching you know a couple do their thing in their bedroom it just didn't really do anything for anyone i don't think like but if you really want to demean it maybe it's a way of to demean someone too if you don't like them you just remind them of their most embarrassing moment and try to spin it off as you being concerned for yourself not being able to dress yeah it's a little bit mean it continues while kim 41 kept her gay towards the front of the courtroom chloe looked visibly annoyed by the comments of course she did the one person who kind of excuses any sort of bullshit men do but then is the first to comment and, ah, anyway fuck her i um, carried that some first same fresh expression as her and her sisters chris walked out of the courtroom for a break chloe kim and chris sat on the first row of the audience seat alongside kylie jenner 24 and their beefed up security team Rob Kardashian 35 was not present. China 33 was also in the courtroom, sat in front next to her lawyer, 
Linny Clanny, her mother Tokyo Tony also attended the meeting. You know what's also funny? Isn't it also funny that you'd imagine as a family, they probably look down on Black China and and um Tokyo Tony, right? Black China's mum. They probably think they're better than them, more classy, more sophisticated, well mannered, richer, whatever. But still in a court of law, they're now having to subject themselves to sit across from this lady to protect their name, protect their brand, protect their likeness and to repair their re reputation because you don't, they don't want this to go. They don't want this. They don't want the conclusion of this to be, yes, you're found guilty of sabotaging this woman's reality TV show because it's going to reveal a very nasty, almost evil conniving side of them that they've done really well to keep under lid. If you think about it as a family, because no one believes any you know i think we've always kind of had this adv um, thinking most billionaires don't get to be billionaires just through being kind nice people all the way through their life they've done some dark nasty cold-hearted shit that's allowed them to attain as much wealth as they have done some people turn a blind eye to it some people can explain it away but it just is what it is it's probably a small co collection of people that have been able to attain that wealth being nice people but for the most part in the world we live in at the moment you have to do some dark shit to get where you want to get to so they've done a good job as a family to keep that under the lid mostly it's all happy stuff family stuff kids stuff career stuff woman stuff blah de blah but you don't really see the nasty dark side of them as business woman in general it's all kind of kept under the lid but this might end up blowing it up into the public and again by two people that they feel like are beneath them people that they probably wouldn't spit on if they're on fire do you know what i mean as of monday two groups of potential jurors totaling 76 people have been asked questions to determine eligibility and serving unbiasedly on the trial how can you man they're too famous everyone there i'm, I'm assuming even the ones that don't know much about black china know her name know her likeness know roughly what is going on with her it's just impossible to find them i would imagine um, attorneys are planning to question a third party panel of 24 potentials on Tuesday. Several of the people questioned Monday said they knew the Kardashians and Jenners because of the kids who watch their shows and follow them on social media. One juror admitted it would be difficult for him to be impartial to a trial because he doesn't like reality TV and wish the show wasn't an any longer. A lot of people have to say. E's Keeping Up Kardashian was up for 20 seasons from 20, 2007 to 2021. During that time, several spin off shows, including Mark Robin China, debuted their latest series, The Kardashians, um, premiered last week on Hulu. And obviously, there's um, Black China there with Rob back in the day. In 2017, China filed a lawsuit against the Kardashians, including Courtney, um, Kendall, and others, over claims of assault and battery, domestic violence, and defamation. Um, in phrase of a protective economic relations, a reality star who shares a five year old dream with Rob accused her ex of being an abuser and his family of being media predators who pulled the plug on the couple's show. China is seeking more than $40 million for the loss of earnings and more than $60 million in loss of future earning capacity damages. The Kadanji Jennings responded to Jennings' claims of a lawsuit of their own legend influencer violently attacked Rob. So it's crazy back and forth. And then I think the other update on it, um, obviously they attended, they shook their heads, there's Black China in a suit. Um, and then I think, what did what did the mum say? The mum said something wild. Yeah, this is Black China's mum who's as ratchet as they come. She says as follows. Black China's mum's, bla Black China's mum, mum, Black China's mum blasted Kardashian Jones Monday night after facing the famous family in court. Tokyo Tony went on Instagram live and said, Kris Jenner, um, Kim Kardashian and Kylie Jenner and Khloe Kardashian looked scary in real life and mentioned them having dips in their faces. <laughs> so mean. They said, it's just so sad. Then Chloe was shaking her fucking head everything that every juror said, Tony recapped. You all right, bitch? Did you have some Xanax or something before you get there, bitch? Tony 50, who appeared to be rolling a blunt throughout the live stream, became increasingly incoherent as she went on to compare old and decrepit Chris to a little man on a tricycle in the horror movie Saw. They look like they had, they're all dead, Tokyo Tony says. But come on, Tokyo Tony, you don't, you don't look like the bastion of good health yourself, madam. Let's be real. Um, but yeah, Miss Jenna was worried about her physical safety, Rose said. Um, the 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 Monday okay. 
That's <laughs> comparing Chris Jenner to what is it compared to to, to Jigsaw movies? It's just <laughs> so mean, man. The illustrations are iconic, though. It's a really good illustration. Whoever drew them, bloody hell, impressive as hell. Who's it by? It's by a person called Mona Schaefer Edwards. Ridiculously good illustration. I'm not going to lie. Um, but yeah, the trial of the century is on at the moment. Defamation. Of the, it feels like everyone's suing each other for defamation, isn't it? Um, Brenda Schub suing people. Uh, who else is suing people? You got the thing with um, Amber Heard and J Johnny Depp. You got this thing. It seems that like everyone's going to court these days and it's to silence people like, you cannot talk about me anymore. Silence. Crazy times. Crazy, 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 crazy times. Moving on quickly. We have this random video um, of what looks like Timothy Chalamet at Coachella. Enjoying himself. Having a good time. And then as he leaves the porter cabins. You know, after probably having a couple of bumps of DLDA. Yeah. <laughs> Or something similar. Oops. I need to start that again because it bumped in and started to make some noises before I could speak about it. So now we also have a video that features Timothy Chalamet coming out of the Porter Blues in Coachella after probably having a couple of bumps of you know what. And there's a horde, a literal horde, maybe an army of paps and just hangers on trying to get his attention and latch onto him. And it made me wonder or made me think or made me realize or made me say out loud to be famous has its benefits. But ultimately, it's probably one of the worst things that can happen to any functioning human being in it. Like who would want to be famous? Who would subject themselves to having this many people follow your every move to the point where you couldn't let your hair down at a bloody music festival and have a cheeky bump couple of shots kiss some randoms and keep it moving without people reporting your every single move now don't get me wrong timothy chamelay is basically the new gen you know flipping leonardo dicaprio right leonardo dicaprio came up at a time when the internet and social media wasn't as prevalent as it is now at the moment or prevalent pre prevalent sorry as it was at the moment but still isn't the guy afforded some level of privacy and especially this kid he's, he's a young kid i'd imagine timothy chamele i'd imagine he's like what under 25 or something like that he's still a child he still needs to live and do his thing the last thing he wants is to be tapped and surrounded by randoms at a festival that he feels like he should be letting his hair down at but instead he has to keep his guard up have his hat really low and put glasses on some sort of disguise so that he can be left alone but still he can't be left alone even when he's going to the slap to the flipping toilet i know sometimes a lot of celebrities say one of the most annoying places that they always get kind of noticed and spoken to and, and someone wants to have a chat is always at toilets because those are usually places where you go by your own and people kind of maybe notice you more often but imagine a port of loot if if this thing was open it'd probably be in front of it trying to take pictures of his flipping dick in it but this is a clip anyway of timothy timothy how do you pronounce his name chalamet or chamelet however you say it timothy um in the portal loser at coachella having the a whale of a time you know fighting a baggy <laughs> fighting to get his key in a baggy coming out and then having an entire hordes of paps trying to get his attention <laughs> Hey, what's up, Timo? What's He's up, got man? good friends, man. Can I have one nice one? Timo. <laughs> Timo. He's got good friends, and I'd imagine part of the good, one of the good things about a festival like Coachella, I'd imagine, because it's in LA and so many famous people or notable people go, you'd imagine there's probably sections and places that are gated off where if you don't have a pass, you can't go like little chill out places, little influence spots, little influencer spots, little brand deal places. Like there's little things that you could probably duck and dive into that can maybe allow you to have somewhat of a private um, experience that isn't so, you know, 
uh, that, that that isn't that does so that doesn't garner detention from randoms all the time maybe that's the thing because he's kind of going through a gate now and maybe disappearing into the night but god almighty man being a celebrity at a festival must be a horror show especially in the states they don't leave you alone in the uk it's different you know there's always pictures of flipping kate moss that flipping glastonbury taken and whatnot but for the most part they get left alone people let them have a good time because it's a fucking festival you know what i mean the, the last thing you should be doing is being on your phone trying to flip in clout chase and get pictures with people like just enjoy yourself take your drugs drink your drink and you know enjoy the show like everyone else is enjoying don't be weird but you know people love to be weird but yeah his friends are good though his friends did a good job of kind of protecting him screening him off from all the weirdos and whatnot um so big up them moving on talk about these shoes that crept up on my timeline the Comte de Garçon and the Nike Air Max Sunder SP I don't really know the model too tough to be honest I might be no let, let me run around that back I might be familiar with it because if I'm not mistaken this might also be the model where back in the day because if you're not viewing this on the podcast then it's a Nike model that essentially has a zip um fasten instead of laces and if i'm not mistaken back in the day this same model it came in like a silver foil upper look like a, kind of like a parachute type material with a with a red bit on it i think that might be the same model maybe it is but one of the things i wanted to mention regarding this collab that i don't really know too much about is that comedy are so similar to like supreme one thing that you kind of the rate about them even though they're they're mostly all retros they always try and pick a shoe that hasn't necessarily been given the light time of day, you know, in terms of Nike's general release things. Or maybe they go to Nike and say, or maybe Nike come to them and say, hey, we want to launch this shoe. We'd think you'd be the perfect partner. I don't think so. I think mostly it's definitely, I think, from the brand side of things. It's definitely more so Supreme saying, hey, we want to push the TW. We like the TW as a model. Can you retro it for us? And they make it as opposed to, nike taking a tw to supreme i think so so same with this i think comedy Gusso probably reached out to nike and said hey we want to do the sunder we like the shape we love everything about it and the good thing about it because comedy Gusso is a flipping proper fashion brand with a capital f these type of shoes work well because they're quite avant-garde they're quite interesting they're quite um different to what's available at the moment it's not an air max one it's not an air force one it's something that they can basically present on the runway and it is a good way to maybe represent them in a sort of athletic silhouette if that makes any sense and also as a brand i'd imagine partnering up partnering up with nike and doing deals like these allows you to also expand into footwear without taking all the risk and doing it yourself you get to you know marry up and partner up with an established brand who know what they're doing who can market, manufacture these things with their eyes closed and you also get their captive audience that already is there right they're already gonna buy the nikes anyway so if you're a fan of these sunders anyway you see them coming out and they've got come to gas or branding and labeling and they're a bit limited you're gonna jump on these all over aren't you and obviously the color scheme them being black or white very in tune with Devon street market they've got an all white pair there's also an all black pair they look really cool I'm not going to lie they're probably going to be very expensive i'd imagine but in terms of a shoe and in terms of being more interesting and kind of asking like I've always said before, I feel like Nike don't really challenge the consumer too tough because they don't make enough newer shapes and newer models. They kind of rely on their archive, sorry, or their retro catalog or archive to kind of propel them and to keep them in the conversation. But unfortunately, with the advent or with the pop, the, the popularity of Yeezy within the general consensus, general public, it feels like people are ready and more open to having newer shapes and stuff. So if you're not maybe going to, give them newer shapes as nike and you're not comfortable making newer shoes maybe the best possible way to go about it is to allow brands to revive and to take out from the archive newer models that haven't maybe been given the time of day models that aren't that well known because the fact that they aren't that well known is going to be challenging enough for a consumer base that's used to buying jordan retros and air force ones all the time you know what i mean so it says as followers, as a, uh, the long-awaited Comme de Garçon and Sunday especially arrived, the collaboration was first revealed that Comme de Garçon's spring 2022 collection show titled Existence of Flowers, designer Ray Karakubo, takes on the 1998 it's silhouette for the contemporary era. The collaboration sees a simplified version of the 90s model 
wrapped in nylon shell that sits atop a leather base. The collaboration is releasing in three colorways, white, black, triple white, and triple black. The exterior is crafted in a neoprene new buck and also features Complus branding on the tongue, which everyone loves in it. The tongue you can't actually see because it's hidden by the zip, but I'd imagine most people will probably ride it or, or wear it zipless. I know me and my wide feet will probably need to wear it zipless if I was going to buy a pair. Um, the Swift branding, the, 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 the meant to release April 22nd. So coming out very soon, check them out if you're that way interested. But I like them, man. They're an interesting model. Um, I think outside of ACG, again, there's not many interesting shapes out there. Nike are kind of bringing back our models overall, and they seem hesitant to create newer shapes. So this might be the best option in terms of having interesting stuff from Nike in terms of footwear, you know, them pulling some non hype things out from the archive and whatnot uh what else we have here let's continue here oh yeah what do you guys think of this is this representation that sean Wotherspoon is down bad or is this more representation that he's now at a place where he can do what he wants and he's being empowered to really push his artistry and creative expression to the limits what do you guys think so this is courtesy of hypebeast it says sean wolverspoon teams up with adidas to give away vintage jackets at coachella so it says as follows aside from all the incredible music acts that flock to idaho ca for the iconic coachella festival the world renowned event is um replant replete whatever that word means with various installations and brand activations for attendees to enjoy this year adidas is taking part in the action for a special initiative with sean uh Wolverspoon as the two parties have linked up to give away repurposed vintage jackets to 100 lucky fans my purpose is here the quote my purpose with this Adidas jacket project was to just simply use as many jackets and hoodies as I could find, whether vintage or not. It kind of devoids the point, isn't it? Um, and print on them so that they could be given a second life and not considered trash or garbage or whatever, said Wolverspoon about his collaboration. Now they'll be in the closets and not landfills. All these unique pieces are from the round two owner's private stash and further expand upon the ethos to shop secondhand and push more sustainable future. No, it doesn't. What? Wolverspoon has been a fan of vintage Adidas track uh, per for nearly 16 years. Yeah, sure. Um, when baggy oversized jackets and aesthetics started to trend, 100 jacket does sound like a lot, but in comparison to the amount of secondhand clothes that are currently available and ready to be upcycled, 100 was easy for me to select. I tried to be as little picky as I possibly could, since the point is to give away as many a second chance, I really tried to leave it behind. If you're attending Coachella on the weekend, keep your eyes peeled for vintage kind of sir, because you might walk away with a free jacket. I'm going to say this is damn bad. He's out here having to take stuff from his own collection, cut it up and make jackets or print on it and make new interesting things and then give them away to fans. Like, what does that do? What is Adidas actually doing for sustainability? Like, what the what is this? It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And does it at all tie in with the shoes that he's making? So the shoes that he's made, are they made out of sustainable materials? Are they all materials that have been taken from past Adidas collections and then slapped on to the model that he's making? Those terrible ones that he made, the Stan Smith with the thread that hangs off, is all that threading from past stuff that was made and he repurposed or things that were going to be thrown in landfills. What? Or was it just new materials that were just made for the shoe itself? I'm not really too sure. But if ever there was an example of a, a visual representation of what a fall from grace looks like it would be this isn't it these two images alongside each other one image of him holding these bin bags full of you know shitty adidas jumpers that no one wanted in the first place and him now printing shit on them to give them away and then the other thing would be these terrible terrible eqt things that he did the collaboration wise especially when you consider the air max that he designed and the air maxes that were due to come out after the fact that he ended up not releasing i guess because at that time his nike deal got cancelled for whatever reason this is an epic fall from grace and it's a side as well because i don't know what happened what occurred for his nike deal to get taken away or for them to walk away or for him to get sat i don't know what happened but it's a shame because you would feel like sean would be the perfect person to do whatever he's doing there with nike because he really is more of a nike guy than an adidas guy 
this guy isn't Adidas at all. There's nothing about this guy that screams Adidas. Adidas was just a, the best second option available to him after he got dumped or maybe he walked away from Nike. But Nike needs this more than Adidas does and it fits their brand more than it fits Adidas. And also the shoes aren't great. They're just terrible. You can tell this is somebody that doesn't like Adidas shoes because of the the sneaker he designed on number one and also the way it's been designed. No one that actually likes Adidas will design a EQT or whatever that model is in that way. No way. It's just terrible. It's terrible. Terrible. And printing, screen printing on, you know, reclaimed old vintage Adidas hoodies and sweatshirts that who's wearing this stuff like just some hipsters guys who live in berlin like who's wearing this stuff literally have you seen day to day who actually goes out and buys vintage adidas jumpers and shit maybe nike windbreakers that's a big thing that second hand market's big adidas sweats adidas t-shirts adidas hoodies really We've all had a period in time. I know I had. I had a couple. I think I had a couple of olive green ones, maybe some yellow and orange ones. But you stop wearing them after a while because the stuff you were wearing them with, you don't wear them anymore. It's sort of like it's, it's a bit of a look. You know what I mean, you don't just stick a uh, a free stripe jumper on on your way to work as something to add a bit of layer. It's something that you're wearing as part of your overall look that you want to give the impression of. So once you're over that look and you're maybe over that scene. It just ends up being something you wear on the day you're doing the washing, the day you're going to have to nip out to go do some shopping. It doesn't become a style piece anymore. And I think this is what happening with those things. Like the question is, why does he have so many of these jumpers in the first place? If they're so in demand, like why are they just all hanging around? Right? It's like, oh yeah, yeah, man. Like you couldn't give this stuff away for free. That's why it's probably giving away for free. You couldn't sell this stuff. No way. What are you going to say? Reclaimed, repurposed Sean Wotherspoon Adidas tops. What are you going to sell them for what? Double their market value or whatever. No one's going to buy them. So then you have to give them away in the hope that people want to wear them. But yeah. Shocking state of affairs, man. I don't like. Me not a fan. Let's see what they're saying in the comments. Let's see if people agree. Because I haven't seen the comments on the hype piece, but they're always brutal. Let's see if they generally agree or don't agree. They said, recycled trash described... <laughs> SW's collaborated is pretty well okay that's maybe agreeing with me here when I saw slide 10 with the childish dog tattoo all I thought about was that scene in Casino where Sam Ace Rothstein had security beat the guy playing his hand in the hammer um, imagine coming into the game so hot round 2 going crazy in LA with the vlogs and social media coverage the Air Max collab and then just completely fizzling out overnight dude hasn't done anything remotely cool or noteworthy ever since must be such a shitty feeling lol yeah, that's why I wonder, like, what happened? Round two was one of the biggest things since Sliced Bread when it came out. He was also a massive presence on social. Like, you, you, it felt like I saw his picture or something relating to him in round two on my discovery page every other day on Instagram. Then, of course, the Air Max collab comes out, which is legitimately what might go down in history as one of the greatest Air Max 1 collaborations of all time in terms of the colorway, in terms of the material application. Like, everything about it is fucking insane. The Air Max 1 slash 87 thing, like, fucking phenomenal, right? Or 98, sorry. The Air Max 1 slash 98. That with a corduroy upper, like, phenomenal. The kind of shoe where, honestly, doesn't make any sense because it's corduroy. But I have a friend that has a pair. I've known people that have worn them themselves, especially... You see people out and about. Where, weirdly enough, that Sean Wolverspoon Air Max 1 might be the most worn limited edition shoe I've ever seen as well. Outside of maybe Sakai's and whatnot. Like you see everyone wearing them, even though they're worth so much. Like they actually wear them because they cherish them. Similar to like the Tom Sachs um, Mars Yards and stuff. Um, but yeah, amazing Air Max, super popular. Everyone flipping loves them. And then it just fizzles out of the blue. It just goes to complete kaput. Like, what happened? What really happened there behind the scenes? Because it feels like he hasn't been able to recover even off the back of that, even lining up again. I this isn't Nike, don't get me wrong, but they're still a major, major sportswear manufacturer. They still have incredible stuff in their archive you can dig in, you can dig through. They still have crazy good collaborations coming out even to this day. Why did it's not working for him? I don't get it. Um, so people saying bum, it's been mean. People right, people putting a corny emoji. Other people saying would have been dope if he could have uh, be brand neutral with Kif, but this dude has no source whatsoever. 
one trick pony i don't think that's true one trick pony is flipping um what's his name um what's his name jeff staple that's a one trick pony the pigeon guy right he just keeps bringing out the same thing again and again and again but at least with sean Wotherspoon, he's new in the game he's not as old he doesn't have such as you know he, he's probably not as entitled has as a big big head as jeff staple does and he's still learning so I don't know why he's fizzled out so quickly. Like he actually has room to grow and get bigger, but somehow it hasn't resonated for whatever reason. And I don't know why. I really don't know why. I'd love to know more. If if anyone knows the information behind the scenes of what actually occurred and why this is a representation of Sean Wotherspoon's flipping career now with him holding these bin bags full of useless garments that no one wanted in the first place and trying to repurpose them and give them away to people who are at a festival where they want to be scantily clad anyway they don't want to be covered up they want to show as much skin as possible because they haven't been eating for six months and they want to show that body off then someone please let me know please because i would love to know what the deal is because it doesn't make any sense to me it just seems like he either got spit out and chewed out by nike maybe he did something behind the scenes maybe the money wasn't right i don't know something happened because it doesn't make any sense it really doesn't but anyway that has been the Agastone Zinger Show episode number 572, I think, hopefully. If it's your first time, check out the show via YouTube and you like what you see and hear, then of course, why don't you interact with all the buttons down below and support the man. If you listen via the podcast app, of course, a five-star review or any review on Spotify or an Apple podcast where you listen to it would be much appreciated. If you want to share the show with your family and friends, I'll be appreciated too. You can also um, subscribe to the Patreon. Links are in the description. My links to my website are also there too if you want to check out the stuff that I do, photography, DJing, all that good stuff in my YouTube channel. You can see the links all in there. And apart from that, thanks again for tuning in. It's been a pleasure to have your company and I'll see you guys again very, very soon. Peace.